Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast. It's your host, Chia Dogu. I took a couple weeks break during the summer just to rest and relax and plan how the podcast is going to continue to go and grow for the rest of the year. Now that we're back, we're going to be releasing some exciting episodes with awesome entrepreneurs from around the world. I have so many interesting episodes lined up that you're just not going to believe. The world's number one hostage negotiator is coming on to the show to teach us a little bit about how to be better negotiators negotiators, but when it comes to high-stakes negotiations like uh, kidnap and ransom situations, as well as when it comes to negotiating things that are more mundane like a, a, jo- a job salary increase or a new job contract, we also have a summit that we're going to be launching very soon. It's a B2B Sales Mastery Summit that's going to launch in November. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But before I go on, just wanted to just say we're back we're back we're back thank you guys for listening and for tuning in during the break and now that the break is over we're just going to give you the live content that you guys continue to enjoy thank you so much to all the listeners who listen from around the world i got emails from switzerland mexico azerbaijan tajikistan uh Papua, New Guinea, so many places that this podcast is touching lives and helping people become better entrepreneurs and better business leaders. So I want to appreciate each and every one of you that is listening, wherever you may be. And I just want to tell you that please tell me, send me your comments, your emails, your questions. I'll be more than happy to share them on the show. I want to make this more in- inclusive as well as interactive so it's not just me and the guests talking and you guys listening and learning but i want to have the voice of my listeners embedded in the show from now on so it's it's a richer program when we all work together to make the show a success so i want to hear your voices i want to share your stories and yeah if you have any testimonials about how this podcast has helped you please feel free to email me at info at odogwu.com and let me know and i'll be sure to read them on the show but before before I get into the episode for today, I just want to say a brief thank you to Startup Festival. Startup Festival held in Montreal in July 2019, and it was one of the best startup programs I've ever been a part of. And there's so many companies that are doing innovative stuff around Canada and from around the world. And they, these guys just all came together to share the stories, to pitch, to connect with investors, media people, and just show the world that, hey, we're doing some awesome stuff over here in the north. And um, yeah, it's really been a blast. I want to thank Startup Festival for the um, invitation to come and cover that event. It was truly amazing and exceptional. I look forward to participating in next year's event. And with that said, guys, let's get on with the interview. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is Bo Henderson. Bo is the founder of Rich Life Financial Advisors. He's a best-selling author whose books include The Rich Life, 10 Investments for True Wealth, The Roadmap to Rich Life, The Five Thieves That Will Steal Your Rich Life, The Rich Life Stewardship principle and masterful communication for success with business and life with Dr. Bill Lampton. He holds a degree in psychology from the University of Georgia, but he's also a media contributor and has written for the Huffington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Reuters, Good Men Project, and a lot of other places. I brought Bo on the show today to tell us a little bit more about what it actually means to live a rich life, because we're not here to just, you know, go to work, pay bills, and die, or whatever, you know, but we need to have a life rich in meaning, in relationships, in friendships, and also in money, too, because we have to prepare for the future, and we don't know what expenses will come along the way. So with that said, Bo, welcome to the program. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions of what it actually means to live a rich life. Thanks so much for having me on the show and for introducing me, uh, but but the reason I that, that rich life philosophy came together for me is because a lot of my life in my early 20s, Um, I believe the exact opposite. I bought what the world sells us, what media teaches us, some marketing teaches us. I believe that the more stuff I had, the more money I accumulated, the more power I had, the more authority I had, the more impressive I was. And lo and behold, one day life kind of slapped me in the face and taught me that's not necessarily the the truth. Mm -hmm. And I I had the privilege of working with a lot of people much older than me um, in doing the work I do in financial planning, retirement planning. And one of the things they taught me was the things that were priceless to them were 
the memories they had from meaningful experiences, their relationships, their most important relationships. If they were gone or lost, they'd give anything in the world to have those back. Yeah. Um, being healthy. And what I, and I realize there's, I don't think it's either or. I think it's a combination. I think I want you to have a hundred million dollars in the bank. I really do. You can do a lot of good things with that, uh-huh. but let's make sure we don't miss the point. And we're using that money to move towards a life that's truly meaningful and exciting to us. Because if not, we might just one day look back and regret all the things we wish we would have done and didn't do. Yeah, that's true. And, and it's funny you mentioned that, you know, the media teaches us that because the media, what they're doing is basically they're trying to sell us stuff. So they have to mm-hmm. push, hey, you need to be, you know, wearing the nicest Gucci clothes or driving the next Mercedes Benz and next year, the next model comes out, you get all that stuff. And it's all a cycle to ensure that they keep their stock price up, they get well paid and live fat while you are in perpetual debt, so to speak, to kind of live up to what the Joneses expect you to live up to, but not necessarily right. be happy in your own self and be content with the things you have. You know, I think a lot of people, um, we most, I think most of us know an example of somebody that has plenty of money and they're absolutely miserable. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's some proof there that money doesn't buy happiness, but I still think that's a belief that subconsciously a lot of us had, if I just had X amount more, mm-hmm. if I just was here, I would be happy. And, and the truth is, is money is a tool. It has no more power than it's dead presidents on paper. Yeah. It's a tool we use. Um, the power we give it, it's an emotional attachment and, and we give it that power to create this, um, this emotional thing, this bigger thing, these beliefs. But at the end of the day, if you can't be happy with less money or little money, you're just going to magnify it if you do have more or come into more. So I think that's, that's the big message is, is let's, let's put money in its place, so to speak. It's a tool. And those who learn how to utilize that tool well are ones that have a successful relationship with money. Yeah, true. So now, Bo, tell us a little bit more about how you got started on this journey to live <laughs> the rich life principles. Right. So, so the rich life, so it, so it goes way back. I was in school at the university of Georgia and, um, I was going to go to graduate school to be a psychologist Uh because I've always been fascinated with behavior and why do we do what we do and why do we so often do the exact opposite of what we should do, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. when it comes to, to human behavior. And my father passed away. He passed away very young. He was 49 years old. And, um, at that point, I went home to help mom with with his small business and, and a couple pieces of real estate, and I immersed myself in kind of some of these financial matters, and that kind of changed the the track for me, so to speak. I, I realized I could help people when they were going through transitions in life mm. um, navigate that successfully, and if and if there wasn't people that truly cared about people to do this the right way there's 10 people that'll show up to take advantage of them. So it really got me on a different track to the financial planning. And at that point I was about 23 years old and, um, I haven't looked back 17 years later. Mm. uh, I realized that the psychology and finance background, actually it seemed bizarre when I was younger. Now it seems perfect Okay, because it, it takes both sides. There's an internal and there's an external tactical component to being successful with money. Yeah. So, I mean, that that makes a lot of sense because I, too, studied finance. And in studying of finance, you understand that it's not necessarily the mechanics of, you know, doing a discounted cash flow or present value of money or putting your money in annuities or whatever. But it's the mindset and the inner game of saying, hey, you know what? What can I look at out there that everybody is looking at and not fully utilize it and then how can I take the tools that I have which is like a hole or a knife basically your financial calculator and whatnot and start creating investments that will help me take advantage of things that I've seen based on behavioral ways that people are operating so take for example something like oh I, I don't know like during the time of the um, housing bubble 
I think this was mm-hmm. in the early 2000s to 2005, 2006. A lot of people were just getting loans because it, it was easy to get a loan to buy a house, right? Some, right. Pe- some smart people were saying, okay, yeah, this is looking like, you know what, well, these guys cannot afford this. They're going to be, there's going to be a problem down the road. Let me short that. So they had the presence of mind and the inner game to understand that, okay, based on the behaviors of people out there, this is not going to work long term, so I can now stand in front of it and profit from that. On your side now, looking at it from a young person's perspective and say, okay, I'm maybe graduating from college now. What can I start doing to prepare me to live a rich life? Yeah, you know, I think I think there's two there's two sides to that, right? So mm-hmm. let's start with the financial. Yeah. If you want to be ahead of 95% of your peers as a young person or as an older adult, we we surveyed this, and finance can be a lot simpler than we make it. You know, we talk about time value of money. We talk about alphas and all these things. It Mm -hmm. sounds really – and it can be complicated, but to be successful with money, what what I found is that uh, one out of 20 people that we surveyed over over a couple hundred people – only one out of 20 people or 5% actually knew their numbers. Mm. So if I can get people just to get clear on what's coming in, what are they actually spending, and then realize that when we know those numbers and have clarity, then we can really start assigning our money to the goals. Is it to save for the future? Is it to invest? Because we all know that if we're going to – we, we want to do those things that's, that we're supposed to do, but we're going to wait till the end of the month with whatever's left. There's mm. never anything left. True. So a simple exercise for a young person, I say, let's get in the habit of saying, hey, you know what? Money is important enough to me. This is a tool I'm going to have to use the rest of my life. It's going to be crucial in how my relationships work out, yeah. right? Um that if, if once a month we could we could do some basic balance, you know, a balance sheet and an income statement. What do I own? What do I owe? What's my net worth? We can use that as a measure. If it's going in the right direction, that's a good sign. If it's not, we need to evaluate. And then the other big one is just most people have no idea about their cash flow, so their mm-hmm. income statement, what's coming in and what's going out. Huh? And if you have clarity around those numbers and you check them monthly, it can actually be fun when you know it. But when you don't know it and it's kind of sliding out of control and money's just kind of recklessly going where it is, it's the difference, Chi, of being reactive and just kind of letting your money dictate what happens and being proactive and saying, mm-hmm. you know what, I've got specific things I want to accomplish. I'm going to tell my money where to go. Because if you don't, it finds somewhere to go, and it's usually not somewhere you're going to look back in 10 years and say, hey, that was a great place for me to put my money. Yeah. So is that where your stewardship principle comes into place, where you're kind of determining, okay, I need to have a disciplined approach in how I manage and spend my money? Yeah, you know, stewardship's funny because there's there's definitely a financial connotation to Mm. that word. We think about biblical stories. We think about other other stories, and we think, and it is there's there's a financial component there that with stewardship, uh, really, really the rule there is before I should be entrusted with more, mm. I should I should take care of what I have. Okay, all right. And you think about that with money. A lot of times, um, people are careless with their money, but they're complaining they don't have more. Mm-hmm. You wonder why. Maybe you didn't take the time to develop the skills to take good care of, of your $30,000 salary before somebody realized you were competent to take the $50,000 mm-hmm. salary than the $100,000 salary. So stewardship is really it's being, it's really being content with what you have while you're moving towards what you want. Um, I say it has a financial component. There's a lot of things we can look at with how do we take care of what we have? Do we, you know, if you have the lowest level job at your company, do you truly do it to the best of your ability? Are you moping around complaining because you don't have that job you think you deserve? Mm. I don't know. But when it comes time to be promoted, who do you think is going to be promoted? The guy doing the best he can at that low level job or the guy that that's um, that's moping around complaining all the time. Right. There's a stewardship example. But it also applies to everything from our relationships to our health, to our physical stuff. It's, hey, before we're ready to have that that next thing, that bigger thing, then it, I think what happens a lot of times people get so focused on what they want they kind of neglect what they have. And okay. when you do that, it often prevents you from getting what you want. So it's kind of a cycle. So so I like that stewardship principle because it kind of teaches us to, as I said earlier, be content where you are, do the best with what you have, and move towards what you want. Oh, okay. So now in doing the best with what you have right now, a lot of people will say, okay, yes, that's fine and great, but you know what, it's right. 50000 is $60,000, you know. 
there's really not a lot room there after taxes and rent and all that stuff. So how do I make the best with what I have right now? Well, I think the key is, is once we know our numbers, we know exactly what's coming in, what our expenses are, what has to go out. Okay. And there's things going out that are necessary. There's things that are discretionary. And um, we can start choosing, would I rather do some of these discretionary things or would I rather invest in my future? Would I rather put money in a Roth IRA? Would I rather um, take this extra money that I, that I and, and knock out any debt I have remaining? Would mm-hmm. I rather play apply a little extra to my student loans. So I, I think the key is is to make your priorities very clear. So say those are my priorities, to invest for the future, pay off the debt I have, and, and work on paying my student loans down. Mm. Then I need to do those first. I need to I need to say, okay, that's going to take me $500 to do those three things. That needs to happen first. And then what's left is what I have to live off of. When mm-hmm. we can learn to make our priorities truly the first priority, um, then's when you see people really start moving towards their goal. Again, the the typical thing you're going to see is people say, yes, those are things that are important. Those are things I want to do. But they wait and say, well, I'll do that with what's ever left. And there's a, there's nothing ever left, right? Mm. We find no place. The money goes somewhere, and it's, you know, it's often siphoning out into, you know, eating out maybe um, twice as much as you should a month on okay. it, buying things that you could maybe wait another six months to buy. So it's just, it's just what's a priority. And that's another good question, Chi, I think to ask yourself is if I'm making this decision to do this, this short term financial move versus um, what I'm saying is my priority, is it truly my priority? Mm. And if it is, I'm out of integrity. If it's not, then I, I need to quit saying it's a priority. Mm. So basically, your actions will determine what your internal um, condition or makeup beliefs that you're doing. Right. Okay. That's it. Yeah. So, what about when you hear things like, okay, I know some gurus on TV will say, okay, yes, you know, for you to make more money, you need to cut out those five dollar lattes and whatnot. You know, and then there are other gurus on the other side that will say, hey, it's not about cutting the five dollar latte; it's about doing things that will get you more income. Because more income means you can enjoy the little things. So where is the balance between the two? Right. Now, I think you, you said it right. I think it's a there's a balance there, right? I think it's important that we don't – if you let your expenses get out of control, you're going to have to do 10 times as much work to, to accomplish the things you want to accomplish. I'm not ever going to not – I'm not ever not going to enjoy um, a latte if I want to. Right. Mm-hmm. Because remember, part of this part of this rich life philosophy, it's, you know, this idea of putting your head down for 20 years and then reaping the rewards. You know, the business I do with with the retirement planning, I've seen people do that and they don't make it 20 years. Mm. So part of it is, is, you know, we want to enjoy the journey, too. So if, so if that cup of coffee, that fancy cup of coffee makes you happy, by all means, have at it. Um and so, so to that extent, I'm saying that five dollars a day you're spending, yes, mathematically, that could be one hundred and fifty dollars a month mm. that in forty years we could turn into a million dollars at a ten percent. you know the math works there, but to me, it's easier to spend my five dollars and uh, but just make sure it's budgeted in my cash flow and then go um, find a way to earn the money that it takes to make that. I've got a discretionary budget that coffee's mm-hmm. part of it. I need to create an income that supports that. Mm-hmm. If I can't support it, I might only be able to do it twice a week. Mm-hmm. Okay. But that, yeah, to me, there's a balance. And you've got to enjoy life because all this stuff we're talking about, fulfillment, happiness, $100 million or nothing, um, if we're not enjoying the journey, we're waiting for some destination mm-hmm. to be happy and, and to be fulfilled. And to, um, we're going to miss the whole point of it because the whole point of it, when we're moving towards a goal or a destination, that's life. Yeah. Right. And I think most of us want to live a happy, meaningful, fulfilling life. Yeah. True. True. Now you've written nine books and you've worked with over 30,000 people to help them, you know, understand their true relationship with money. So what are the common mistakes you've seen and what are some of the interventions you've brought that have helped people transform their financial lives? Yeah, I think we've hit on some of them. One of them mm. is um, 
uh, a sim- the problem with that not knowing your numbers, mm-hmm. I call it the ostrich with your head in the sand technique. And that's okay. basically, I'm going to bury my head and not think about it and hope everything turns out okay. okay. It's a horrible financial plan, but that's a lot of people's financial plan. Yeah. They just don't want to deal with money. Um, so that's a big mistake. And you see people carrying around stress, fear. Um, you can almost see it like it's on their shoulders, mm-hmm. carrying around these money concerns and worries. And one of the things that it came up on a radio interview I did earlier today is when you're when you experience fear, anxiety, doubt around money, this this negative emotion, there's one antidote that I found that works and that's clarity. And it goes back to mm. let's get really clear on where we are, let's get really clear on where we want to go, and let's come up with some action items to start moving towards it. So any of those negative emotions that, that we see out there, it's usually a matter of going back to the basics, getting clarity and moving forward. Uh, so so those are some of the big things. You know, I, I see a lot of um, not communicating in relationships. If you have a spouse or a partner or whatever, and you're not having conversations about, hey, here are my beliefs about money. Here's my experience with money. And let me know yours. It's a very mature conversation to have because if not, if we don't do that, we have a tendency as humans to think, your experience, your beliefs, and everything are exactly the same as mine because that's what I know and understand. Mm. And you can guess the conflict that causes in relationships. Sure. And that's why money can be one of the biggest um, causes of problems, divorces, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So communication about money. And um, Wait, again, so, I think if, so. One second before we move off that particular topic. So how do yeah. you get how do you get two people that are on different understandings of money on the same page? Because on the one hand, I've usually seen where the guy or the girl is very smart and sharp with money, but uh-huh. then the other person is very loose with money. So I had an Uber driver the other day, and he told me, oh, that his wife is phenomenal with money. They have four mm-hmm. years to go and pay off their house. She manages all the money in the house. And he just, you know, he lives a carefree life. He, if he wants to do anything, he has her permission, and then they, she plans out what the family is going to do in terms of money. So how do you get two people to get on the same page when they're so diametrically different? Right. You know, and that's funny. Uh, so one of the, a lot of the times I'm the role of this neutral third party okay. because these people, you rarely have a couple attracted to each other that, that approach money the same way. Usually yeah. there's, there's an opposite mm-hmm. component. There's yeah. somebody that there's somebody that's a little more, um, geared to handle the money as a primary role. And, mm-hmm. and like you said, there's a spender, a saver. There's, there's usually a, a difference there. There's, yeah. there's so, so as, so what I do a lot of times as a third party, we talked about, uh, the importance of the communication mm-hmm. and the importance that ha- I had, I had one couple, one wife called me saying that when I got them monthly, just talking about money, it was the most intimate thing that they'd experienced in, in years. Wow. I was like, wow, that's, that's powerful. But how do we do that? So what we have to do is, and this is tough with relationships, right? Um, relationship partner, a relationship partner B, here's my deal. One, I've got to make sure her partner understands where she's coming from. Okay. Here's my beliefs. Here's my behaviors. Here's how I, here, here's who I am because that's what it is. And then partner, then I got to make sure partner B communicates and and partner a knows those things and then what's going to happen is there's never a you're right you're wrong it's based on the dynamic of your relationship how you both interact with money your beliefs your behaviors your patterns where's that middle ground that's going to work for this family Mm -hmm. so usually usually there's a give and take a little bit and hey the guy that's that likes to spend a lot of money you're probably going to have to give him a budget to spend or he's Mm -hmm. going to be very miserable um the lady that tracks every dime, you're probably still going to have her tracking the budget for the family because that's something that she's kind of wired to do. Yeah. But I think the key with a family is to um, get them to respect their differences and say, and and then say, okay, where where is that spot that we can meet this this to work for our family? Mm-hmm. Because as long as it's I'm right or you're wrong or you're wrong and I'm right, it's always going to be a lose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And have you found your interventions to have saved marriages and relationships? In the yeah, few years I, like working? I said, that comments, comments like yeah. we talked about, um, 
wow, we've never had such good com- – because most of the times couples just don't talk about money. Really? Unless, right? They don't talk about money unless it's coming up usually in a negative or stressful true, context. True, true, So that gives it that energy we talked about earlier, that energy that it's bad, that it's stressful and all yeah. this. So when you talk about it just because, hey, once a month we talk about this, you start taking away – that negative energy because it's just a tool. Now you start transitioning to a tool from this negative energy. So, um, yeah, no, I've had great. Uh, Another thing is just the, that's been very powerful is we talked about one, one partner is usually more involved, the other less involved getting that other partner that's not as involved, at least to know what's going on. It's powerful Mm -hmm. because they don't feel like I'm just blindly kind of don't really know what's going on. And as you get later in life, heaven forbid something happens to one of the partners, it's very good and very powerful that they have an eye. They know what the the plan's been. They know what they've been doing. They understand a little bit better. Okay. Okay. Now, um, I love that we're talking about the subject of money and relationships because that triggered a memory. I I listened to a podcast, I think, with Tim Ferriss and um, Ramit Sethi, who's into personal finance. And Ramit was talking about how before he got married to his wife a couple months ago, he brought up the topic of um, prenuptial agreements that uh, they both kind of have to sign. And there was this whole big ordeal before <laughs> they both mm-hmm. eventually signed the prenuptial agreement. So now I'm thinking, okay, you know, young people listening to this, you know, mid-20s, mid-30s, going forward thinking, okay, you know what, I'm trying to earn as much as I can. You know, I don't know what the future holds. Um, I don't know, well, they say 50% of marriages end in divorce. Is it a good idea for somebody starting a new relationship to think along the lines of hedging their bets at the beginning of the relationship on the financial side? Yeah, you know, most of the time, it's a funny question. I mean, it's a good question. Uh, most of the times, uh, say, say as a younger person starting a relationship together and you truly are building a life together, meaning you're, you're building a business and this partner's there. Mm. I don't see as, as much uh, of the the early prenuptial agreements. Now, okay. in Ramit's remit, situation, he's accumulated a lot of assets. Yeah. So he's bringing a lot of assets into the picture. Yeah. So I, I see that more, especially with, with a little bit older demographic I work with sometimes, that um, you show up into maybe a second, sometimes third marriage, okay. and you're bringing your business, your assets to that table – that really wasn't built together, and that really mm-hmm. wasn't something that person. So um, the prenup is can protect you because okay. you know, you know as well as I do. A lot of um, depending on the luck of the draw and how court goes and the attorneys go, you could show up and a year later have half of your assets removed from you. Yeah, if things don't work out. Yeah. So I think to to me in my role as an advisor, it's it's if you're showing up we got to take some of the emotion out of that conversation and say, Hey, is this a move to protect you? Okay. But, uh, I don't really see, it's a little different if, if we're showing up without, you know, two dimes to rub together and we're going to start <laughs> this thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a little different, but yeah, I do, I do see where it's valuable, but I think, but it, but it's a thing. It's just like so many of the other things we're talking about right now. Mm-hmm. Chi is, is you got to remove the emotion from that conversation. Cause it's, that really is, it sounds, it sounds harsh, but that's a business decision. Okay. Okay. You know? Yeah. No, no, I mean that, that makes sense because I have been in situations where we're discussing it as young men and everybody's like, Oh yeah, well you never know. I might want to protect myself. And I'm like, dude, you barely have a hundred bucks in your pocket. <laughs> home and abroad. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So what are you Go trying to, to protect? Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. So as we start to wind on the show, Bo, um, I have a couple of wrapping up questions for you. So I guess my first question is this, you know, looking back on the trajectory of your career thus far, for someone that has achieved the level of success you have as an advisor, and then somebody listening to this podcast thinking, oh, wow, I like what Bo has said. And you know what? I think I would also want to follow in the path of becoming a financial advisor myself. Mm-hmm. What do you think would have helped you achieve success faster? Or what do you think you could have done differently that you should have done? I, I think the biggest thing, is, it, specifically this industry, but I'm sure that it applies to a lot of things, is that um, th- there's a couple of, of steps, right? Mm. To do what I uh, – Rich Life Advisors is an independent firm. 
Um, but I think the first thing you do is you get in with a, with a company. A lot of times it'd be like a big name company, um, that has good training programs. So you can learn, you get your licenses, you, you, you learn the business, you learn how to do applications, you learn how to have conversations with people. And so I think that is, is maybe look at a big company to start with, but what happens then is eventually your, as long as you're a student of your craft, you'll outgrow that company. Okay. And, and what I mean by that is, is once you build a, a little bit of a client base, um, you don't need to trade off the trade off of having the big name behind you mm. and, and you can go do an independent firm. But I think early on, and for some people staying in that, that place, a whole career makes sense and works for them. But I think that would be where I go is just get some experience. Don't, don't look for it. I think what I see a lot more and more coming out is people get out of school looking for their dream job. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, and that's frustrating when, when we, we brought on new associate advisors, they say, Bo, this looks great. You're out doing all this stuff and, and you have these clients and blah, blah. Like, that's great. And, and they get frustrated when they're not there within six months. Uh-huh. And I said, it took 17 years. Yeah. You got to kind of, you got to kind of go the path. You got to get the experience. You got to build a level of foundation. So I think that's, it is just, um, Get started in the business. Learn as much as you can. Go into a big, uh, good training program. Get yourself in a um, an environment where you're going to be able to meet and actually interact with as many clients or, as possible. Uh-huh. Because I can tell you this, understanding people and interacting with people has a lot more to do with your success and longevity uh-huh. than if we have a doctorate in finance. Okay. And what are some of the things that have helped you, you know, stay at the top of your game for 17 years, you know, whether it's books, programs and courses, podcasts you listen to, um, what has it been that has helped you keep that skill level sharp and that ability to connect with people, figure out problems and give them solutions? Yeah. Um, one of the things I decided a long time ago, I love to learn and I love to teach. Okay. So it, tur- it turns out really nice because I'll, I'll learn what will help clients and then I turn around and teach them. And it's kind of, it's kind of served me well. Mm-hmm. And along the way that's, that's allowed me to, to, uh, to accumulate a lot of, of specialized information designations, um, that can be a unique proposition from the other hundred people in my city that do what I do. Okay. So I think, I think one of the things is just be a student of your game, um, study things, uh, that I think that was important too is is maybe not just study things I study things I, I I'm interested in but also study things that your clients are in or, or your your or I do, your market's interested in so that you can serve them with that um, but I think that's always be a student another one this is going to make you laugh is be like Madonna that's going to be my second piece of advice <laughs> and what I mean by be like Madonna is you've got to be willing to reinvent yourself because yeah. remember I, I told you my story my first five years I was with one of those big companies getting uh-huh. started learning the business and I had a real hard look at myself and realized the way I'm taught to do this business the way the industry does this business I don't like it. I, yeah. I'm not going to do this for another 20 years. And that's about the time the rich life idea and the philosophy came together. I said, I'm going to have to reinvent and create my own way of doing this that helps people and it works. And I, I, I went away from that message of being your what the, the traditional financial planner was supposed to be. And I became the rich life guy, so to speak. Mm. So, and, and the reason I believe that works when I say be willing to reinvent yourself, I think the caveat there is reinvent yourself to something that's you. Hmm. something you believe in and then be true to that. I think why what I do works is because no one ever doubts that I believe in what I talk about. Yeah. Right. Whether it's, whether it's a hundred percent perfect philosophy that they believe in, they know I believe in it with conviction. And I think that helps people buy into what you're doing. Okay. And in terms of uh, books, for example, that you've enjoyed reading that have helped to uh, clarify your thinking, what are some right. books you would recommend? You know, a couple of that come to the top of my mind, Chi, are um, I love um, about once a year, I like to at least listen to the audio book of, of Stephen Pressfield's War of Art. Okay. Yeah, it's really good. I recommend that to any young entrepreneur. And um, another one, and this was this was a, somebody I interviewed that was a great guest. This would be somebody good for this show, Chi. Um, his name is Greg McEwen, and he wrote a book called Essentialism. Okay, yeah, I think I've, I think I have that book actually. Yeah, yeah, and, and Essentialism is really basically about it. It kind of has a, a rich life theme. It's about hey, 
we can live a, a better life when we're only doing what's truly essential. And so many of us are so frustrated, um, so burnt out because we're saying yes to so many things. It's a really good book. Okay. I recommend that too. So those are two that come to the top of my mind. But um, going back, I can remember my early 20s when I started out, real big fan of personal development all the way back to like Jim Rohn, mm. Brian Tracy, Dennis Waitley, some some old school yeah. um, personal development and, and kind of coming for today. Because I think if we don't work on ourselves and we don't keep our mindset right, mm-hmm. um, then it's hard. I mean, this, this this business, I think it has a 90, 93, 94 percent failure rate within three years. Really? So wow. you have to keep your you have to keep your mind right. You have to be positive. And um it's not if you're going to have challenges. It's when you have challenges, how do you respond to them? Yeah. Uh, so, so I think, yeah, I think those are a couple of good books. Podcasts, I love hitting podcasts, but a lot of them are boring. Like I'll listen to podcasts about social security claiming strategies. That's one of the books I wrote. That's not really exciting to most people, but I know it's something I can learn and go turn around and help clients, mm-hmm. the people that count on me. Mm. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Ah. And I guess, I know you've touched on this in the Be Like Madonna, but... In terms of looking at the future now with the rise of machine learning, AI, robo advisors and all that stuff, you know, how how do you see that affecting your industry and your business? And what do you think young people that are trying to follow in your footsteps can do to kind mm-hmm. of make themselves future proof and not be made redundant by things like technology? Yeah. Well, the opportunity for a young person in this industry is phenomenal. And I think the message is because the people that need help, I mean, this is when um, I'm talking to somebody, I'm interviewing somebody, that, another financial advisor, it's always funny to me when they feel like we're competition. Cause I, hey, 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 brother, if we helped everybody we could with every minute of every hour, there's still 10 times that many people in our city that need help. So, I mean, yeah. there's, there's just tremendous opportunity for helping people with financial issues. Um, uh, I think that the key with future proofing, so to speak, is to embrace technology, but don't avoid it. Right. So, so embrace it, use it for what it is. Um, I think a, a lot of the older people in this industry still, they try to avoid it and it catches up with them and it bites them. But if you embrace the technology, but also realize that when you're dealing with emotional things like people and like money, mm-hmm. there will always be this thing. They need competency. They need trust. They need somebody that can listen. So I think, uh, you know, they tried that, uh, a few years back to go all robo advisors, low, low cost, mm-hmm. uh, machine generated portfolios. Now, could I use those things? And I do sometimes to, to help somebody's portfolio. Yes, but that doesn't replace a person that's sitting here helping you with a strategy to know where to plug in that robo advisor. Mm-hmm. So I think the key is to, is to say, Hey, if I'm a high touch person that really likes helping people and finance is exciting to me. Uh, and even you might even say is coaching exciting to me because I do just as much coaching in this role as I do financial planning. Yeah. Um, I think that's those are the two things I'd say. Embrace technology, utilize it, but always remember this is going to be a human business because people don't want to trust their money necessarily to to a machine, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. You know, because this is an emotional. We're dealing with two emotional things: yeah. humans and money. Yeah, yeah. And with that said, Bo, we've reached the end of the show. It's been a pleasure talking to you about you know crafting your life to live a rich life and learning about the art of managing and making money. Um, Any final words of wisdom for listeners out there in the audience? You know, I think let's just, let's just wrap up with it, with what, what the rich life really is. And um, we talk about your definition of a rich life. Now here's the beautiful thing about that is, and why this philosophy has worked so well is that I can't tell you, I can't come to you and say, Hey, gee, this is what you need to do to have a rich life. Mm. But we could have a conversation and talk through. When I see your eyes light up, when I see you talking fast, when I see that thing that really is meaningful to you, yeah. that's a real good clue that that might be the life we should start moving toward. Okay. Your definition of a rich life. So it's always fun for me to ask listeners, to ask, to ask clients, to ask guests, what's your definition of a rich life? Because it's really fascinating to learn what really is important to somebody. Yeah. And, and, and the problem is, I see out there in this country today and why, why I keep bringing this message is 
So many people are just sleepwalking through life. They're going through the roles. They're a parent. They're a student. Um, they're they're an employee. Whatever that is, and they're just kind of sleepwalking through life. And I and that's a very reactive way mm-hmm. to go through life. And I can tell you, as a little bit older guy, is that one day you wake up and ten years went by like that. Yeah. Twenty years goes by like that. Um, so the rich life message is really a call to hey, this is important to me. I want to live a life that's meaningful. I want to live well. I want a fulfilling life. So I'm going to proactively control, just like our money we talked about earlier. I'm going to proactively make the investments, uh, utilize the principles that are going to ensure Mm. that I'm enjoying life. And one day when I look back, I'm going to say, you know what? There's not a thing I regret. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And where can people find you and learn more about you and how to live a rich life? You know, I think a really good place to start, uh, my publisher did a really cool thing. Um, if you go to richlifebook.com, Rich Life the, the very first book, and it's still my favorite book, it's The Ten Investments for True Wealth. It's really the foundation and the philosophy of what we've been talking about, uh, really the art of living well. Um, you can get Rich Life, you can get the, the Ten Investments book for, I believe, six ninety five shipping and handling at richlifebook.com. And I think that's a really good place to kind of just start learning about this idea and philosophy. And of course, um, if you want to get in touch with me, richlifeadvisors.com is our website. Cool. And I'll be sure to put that in the links in the show notes once this episode is published and ready to go live. So thanks a lot for coming to share your story, man. I truly appreciate you taking the time to do this. Hey, Chi, had a lot of fun. Thanks. And there you have it. Thank you guys for tuning in to listen to Bo Henderson tell us how to live a rich life. And you can get more from Bo Henderson by going to his website, which is www.bohenderson.com. That's B-E-A-U, Henderson.com or therichlife.com. And you can learn more about Bo and his business and what he does to help people um, get out of debt and live a financially prosperous life. Also, you can also go to my website to get in touch with me to learn more about what we're doing with the show and with the program. Or if you want to get tickets for our B2B Sales Mastery Summit, which is going to launch in November, you'll be hearing a lot more about that in the upcoming episodes. But you can go to www.odogwu.com forward slash B2B SMS. And with that said, I'll see you in the next interview. Ciao for now.